So we said in our praise then that we are looking at the deep things of God and uh, we are doing so by uh, focusing our attention on chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. And I think it's a good idea, uh, this may be the last time that we look at this passage, that we read it as a whole again. So 2 Corinthians 12, and uh, we'll read from the first verse. So it's doubtless not profitable for me to boast, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And so I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, only God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man again, whether in the body or out of it, only God knows, how he was caught up into paradise. And he heard words that he could not understand and which were not lawful for him to repeat. Now of this man I will boast, yet when it comes to myself, I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might have the desire to boast, I would not act like a fool. For I want to speak the truth. So I refrain from boasting, lest anyone should think me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And in fact, lest I should ever be tempted to be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now about this thing, I asked the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And his reply was, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that verse, verse 10, is our text. So let's repeat it again. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's ask God then to open up his word to us. Lord, as we said in our praise, and as we've just reminded ourselves in our comments to each other, we are dealing again today with the deep things of God. And so we do ask you, our God, to give us all the grace, all the understanding, and all the help of the Holy Spirit that we need. Lord, we commend ourselves to you then, because not one of us can understand the Bible unless you become our teacher and unless you give us the grace to understand. Lord, we have said so many times, but it remains true that understanding of your word it's not a matter of intelligence. It's not a matter of education. It's not about how big our brain may be. And it's not even a matter of our experiences, how long maybe we've been a Christian. Understanding our God at any level is given to us by your Spirit. So may he give us today the understanding of your word that will help us, that will encourage us, strengthen us, that will challenge us, that will shape us, that will be the solid rock upon which we build our lives, that will guide us and direct us 
Lord, may we be given the understanding that we need at the present moment in our lives. So, Lord, we turn to you, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are thinking then, aren't we, about the, the deep things of God. And um, what I want today to do is to sum it up, if I can. And I want to sum it up with a, with a phrase. Everything that we've said so far, and whatever we may say now going forward, can be summed up with this phrase. What we are dealing with is the theology of the cross. We've been talking about God's way of working. We've seen that God works through foolishness, that God works through weakness, and that God works through mystery. Now, these three ways in which God works, it's seen overwhelmingly in the cross of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you just cast your minds back a bit, you could go into 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through to 4, especially chapter 1 from verse 18, and you can see how Paul talks there about how the cross is foolish, and you can also see how Jesus was crucified in weakness. So the cross is the perfect uh, illustration of this deep way, the way of God to work through weakness and foolishness. And uh, what we've seen, I hope, over the weeks is that God's way of working is the very opposite of the way in which our world functions. So everything in the world is about strength and it's about power and the world is all about might and size and numbers, and greatness. That's how the world is shaped. And so you hear, don't you, in the world, about the strongest this, and the greatest that, and the biggest the other, and that's how the world just gets by, by emphasising its power and its strength. Now, in contrast to this, we have our God. And God has chosen to work in foolishness and in weakness. And uh, for me, the great challenge of this is to look at the church. And does the church reflect the way that God works? Or does the church reflect the way that the world is? Now, when you turn to Corinthians and the church there, it's very clear that this church caused so much trouble for the Apostle Paul because the values of the church in Corinth were the values of the world. So you as a church who boasts in numbers, how big a congregation they've got, you as a church that boasts in its visions and it boasts in its gifts and it boasts in its money. So this church, the Corinthian church, without even realising it, were no different at all in terms of its values to the world to which it belonged. Now, I said a few weeks ago, and, you know, I don't know what you think. We don't have so much chance to talk these days, do we? But what I said a few weeks ago was this. It seems to me in the history of the church that we've forgotten the deep things of God. The church has been through the centuries, and even today, still like the world. We are still concerned about numbers and about size. We are still concerned about gifts. We are still concerned about activity and what we are doing. And it seems that, I would even say, you and I here are still concerned about these things. When you turn to God and you look at how God works, it is the very opposite of the concerns of the world. So, beginning of the service today, we read from Hebrews. And there in Hebrews, you get the same idea of weakness. 
We've seen it in 1 Corinthians. We've seen it in 2 Corinthians. We can look right throughout the New Testament and you see the same emphasis. It's an emphasis on weakness and how in weakness God makes his power known. So let's call it then the theology of the cross. The church is meant to identify with and the church is meant to reflect the theology of the cross. And I would even say you and I as Christians, we are meant to understand that our lives are to reflect the theology of the cross which is a theology of weakness and foolishness. So let me see if I can put it like this. The cross is the ultimate expression of the weakness and the foolishness of God. In the church, God then works out that principle of weakness and foolishness. And then in the individual life of the Christian, he asks us to understand that his way in our life is to work through weakness and foolishness. So I'm going to do something I said to Tracy before the service I wasn't going to do. Why am I going to do this next bit? Well, I was a bit rude to David Brooks on the way in, so I say a, a, an apology to David Brooks. But today is my 30th anniversary of being your pastor. So 30 years have passed since I was ordained. Most of you have forgotten, I expect. Most of you didn't even know that today would be a 30th anniversary for me. And as you look around on a 30th anniversary, what do we see? And what we see today is weakness, and foolishness. There's not many of us here today. Where's everybody else who were coming last Sunday and the Sunday before? What I've struggled with sitting here before the start of the service was a feeling of weakness. If I'm going to be quite frank with you today, I don't feel up to it. I don't feel up to being here, and I certainly don't feel up to talking to you. And I don't feel up to it because I feel weak. I felt weak all week, and I feel weak today, and I feel weak because there's so few to talk to, and I feel weak because I'm wondering where everybody else is. This weakness is characteristic of the way that God works. God chooses to use the weak things. He chooses to make weak, he chooses to work foolishly in ways that don't make sense to us to achieve his purposes. And so how is it then, feeling like I do, I'm standing here and talking to you? Do I have a choice? Could I walk out and say, that's it guys, I just can't face it today? Could I do that? You've made, you guys have made the effort to come, which is great, so that wouldn't be fair to you. But I guess what has helped me to stand here today and to talk to you is this. This is a sermon about weakness. And so if I'm feeling weak, I could be in no better condition to deliver this sermon today. I'm in the perfect condition to talk to you. And it seems to me in many ways that you could look at today, at this morning now, almost like a visual aid from God, in a way that perhaps I'm wrong to think, but nonetheless in a way that is helping me, I'm imagining that God has decided this today. God has almost said this, look Neil, you're going to preach about weakness, so I'm going to make you weak, and I'm going to make sure that on Sunday morning there'll be very few there, so that your weakness will feel even worse. And I'm going to make it clear to everyone that 30 years down the line, this is as weak as you are. I'm going to make it clear so that when people come and they look around and they see so few, 
They're going to be ready to listen to weakness. And so thinking like that has helped me to stand up and talk. Weakness is how God works. Weakness is how God achieves his purposes. Weakness is made clear in the cross. Now, if we turn to our text once more, what I want you to see in verse 10 is one thing. What is our attitude to weakness meant to be? Now, take a look at verse 10, and let's read it again. Therefore, I take pleasure in uh, infirmities. I take pleasure in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I'm going to leave that phrase, when I am weak, then I am strong. I'm going to leave that to the very end. But as you look at that verse up to that point, what should your attitude be to weakness? Therefore, says Paul, I take pleasure. What I'm summing up is this. God chooses to work through weakness. God will always work through weakness. God will not give up that plan because we dislike weakness, because we don't like being weak. God, that's his preferred method. So what God calls us is to have the right attitude to weakness. Now, what that attitude is, you see here, in verse 10, and it's summed up by the word pleasure. I take pleasure in. And for some of us, that's too strong, okay? The idea of taking pleasure in weakness, that God wants you to rejoice in weakness, that he wants you to be glad of weakness. That might sound a little bit too much for us this morning. So let's unpack it a little bit. What's very clear in these verses, from the verse, uh, verse 9, where Paul has this revelation, what's important to see is what Paul doesn't say. So what Paul doesn't say is this. He has stopped praying for the thorn in the flesh to be removed. So our first attitude to weakness is to stop asking for the weakness to be removed. So if you are weak today, and if we are weak today, we do not turn to God and ask him to remove that weakness. Because to remove it is to resist it. But can I say this? It's also to resist God. It's to resist the way that God has chosen to work. And so implied in Paul's uh, verses here is the sense in which the response God wants us to have to weakness is not to ask him to remove it. Now that's an amazing thing. And I would guess it's a frightening thing. And I would guess that for you, like for me, this is something we haven't done. We have asked God, we have pleaded with God to remove our weaknesses. And here we have the exact opposite being laid out for us. It's as if Paul has had a great light bulb moment where he's realised something for the very first time. And he's realised a great thing that God is calling him to an entirely different attitude to weakness. Entirely different to the world, entirely different to the Corinthians, entirely different to how he has been. It's an attitude that doesn't ask for resistance. So whatever is making you feel weak, What's made me feel weak? Well, I'm not going to tell you. But whatever has made you feel weak, if it's physical, 
if it's mental, if it's emotional, if it's the lockdown and all its restrictions, so you're not able to do what you uh, once did and you want to do, you can't see the family, if that's making you weak, whatever is making you weak, God has chosen to work through weakness. And so what we don't do is ask for it to be removed. If you come to this thorn in the flesh thing that we've seen here in verse 7, do you remember we said a few weeks ago this could be Paul's um, physical problems? Paul had uh, probably something like glaucoma or, or whatever the, those eye illnesses are. He, he was beginning to lose his vision. So a thorn in the flesh can be a physical illness. It can be a difficult relationship, and Paul's relationship with the church at Corinth was very difficult, so that could be a thorn in the flesh. We are not meant to limit it. We're not meant to say that this thorn in the flesh is something but not another thing. It's anything that makes you weak. It's anything that makes the congregation weak. It's anything that makes the churches weak. Now, what we are meant then is not to ask for it to be removed. Not to ask God. Instead, what Paul is saying to us here is this. What we are to understand is that it's God who makes us weak. And when we then embrace that weakness, when we stop resisting it and complaining about it and fighting against it and wishing it away, when we stop that, in that very moment where we give up the struggle and accept in that very moment, the power of God is made available to us. It's the power of God that follows an acceptance. It's the power of God that follows giving up the struggle. That's what Paul sees. And that's what Paul wants to communicate. Now, you and I are going to have to work this out for ourselves. And we saw in Hebrews that it involves coming to the throne of grace, it involves coming to where our high priest is, and it involves coming to him and acknowledging that we are weak. It means coming to him and accepting that we are weak. And then in that condition where we are open and accepting, and receptive in that moment, the power of God is available to us. Now, let me say two more things about this, if I can. The first is that this is a mystery. Now, do you remember we said way back at the beginning, God works in three ways. Foolishly, weakly, and mysteriously. Well, this is one of the mysteries that God makes his power available to us in weakness, when we embrace weakness and accept weakness, that's when his power is made known. Not before, not until we come before him and say, God, we are weak and we accept it, and we acknowledge it, and we see that it's your ways, this is you at work, you've made me weak, so I can be for you and accept it. And do you notice what I did then? I did something that I was battling with. I said, just perhaps by a slip of the tongue, God makes us weak. And that's actually the deepest thing of all. It is God who makes us weak. And so you see it, don't you, in these verses. We have it in verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure 
by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, he calls it there a messenger of Satan. That's a reference to the book of Job. But what you see in the book of Job is that God is behind this. And these verses are a bit like the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, you don't have the name of God directly. We don't refer to God at all directly, but God is hidden behind the scenes. Well, that's the same here. God is behind the scenes, and he is making us weak. And he is doing that so that when we then acknowledge that weakness and accept that weakness, he is then ready with his resurrection power to be given to his people. So what I think is the most amazing thing here is this. And I'm going to be brave because I do know what some of you are going through. If you're weak, God has chosen to bring that weakness to you so that he might show you his power. And in a sense, what Paul sees you is the privilege of that. It's the wonder of that, that God has so chosen to deal with Paul like this. Paul has got a million reasons to be weak. In fact, out of most people, Paul is the weakest. Out of all the apostle, he's the weakest. In terms of all his experiences, he's the weakest. Because as we saw in uh, chapter 4, he's crushed, he's perplexed, he's abandoned, he's forsaken. And if you go into chapter 11, you can read that he was shipwrecked and he was beaten and he was arrested and he was put on trial. All of these are a string of weaknesses that God brought to the life of of the Apostle Paul. And Paul sees the privilege of that because it's as if God has singled him out for a great thing. And of course, the great thing is that he would know the power of God. So if you feel weak, it's the very opposite of the idea that God has abandoned you. If you feel weak, it's the evidence of the work of God in your life, bringing you to see his power and his grace. So the last thing then is at the end of verse 10. And uh, it's one of these statements that's an actual formula in the Greek. You could see it if you're clever enough to read Greek, I guess. Look at verse 10. When I am weak, then I am strong. That statement is called a when-then formula. And there's uh, lots of when-thens in our Bible. They are two halves of a statement, and both are true, and you need both of them at the same time. So just remember this as a when and a then. When I am weak, then I am strong. You need weak to be strong, When you are weak, you'll be strong. Strong is is promised you. These two belong together. Weakness and strength. But what comes first? What comes first is weak. Weak has to be first. And weak will remain first. And weak will remain present until... We come to God in the way described in verse 10, taking pleasure in it, accepting it, not fighting it, not resisting it, not wishing it away, not wishing things were different. Weak will remain there until that moment when we come to say to God, God, we accept it. We accept this weakness. Whatever form it takes, however painful it is, we accept it, and we accept it in your presence. We accept it as your way. We accept it in your wisdom. We accept it in your purposes. And as we accept it, so we will know 
your power given to us. We will know that resurrection power and we will know that sufficient grace that will transform us. It will change us. And to me, that's the great thing about this passage. When, when you get to verse 10, you see a completely different Paul to the one you see at the beginning of chapter 12. As the chapter opens, Paul is in conflict. He's in conflict with himself. He doesn't want to boast about his revelations, but the church has driven him to distraction. So Paul is, is troubled and he's discouraged and he's annoyed and he's angry with himself and he's frustrated with this church at Corinth. That's the Paul you see at the beginning of chapter 12. And then as you go down to the verses, as you follow Paul, as he tells you his experience, what a difference we see in him when we come to verse 10. And here he is transformed because he's understood that weakness is God's way. And weakness is the moment to know the grace and the power of God. So let's pray together.